All righty. So welcome again, welcome again once more to the webinar on a strategic approach to developing a robust online program portfolio. So without further ado, I'd like to hand the mic over to David Capranos, who is the Director of Market Strategy and Research at Wiley Education Services. The floor is all yours, David. Hi, thanks for that. Um, and thanks for everyone on, uh, on the phones there joining us today. Um, I myself am joined uh, today by Polly Smith, the Associate Provost for Online Learning at Utica College. Polly and I, um, our, uh, our goal today is to take you through a little bit of rundown of a thinking of um, how we develop uh, strong online portfolios. We're going to do uh, the beginning of the presentation will be thinking about it more broadly and, and some of the tools that Wiley Education Services has used to um, consult with our, our different partners about how to grow their online portfolios. And then Polly is going to give us a look at um, the work that she's done at Utica College. And then the goal is to open it up for some uh, hopefully robust Q&A towards the end of the presentation. <clears throat> Polly, can you hear me fine? I, I can hear you and welcome everyone. Great, there's Polly. So you'll hear more from her towards the end. So today, like I said, our agenda is, uh, we've already got our introductions out of the way. We're going to get into a, a conversation around what we feel strategic portfolio development looks like, what its benefit is. We're going to do a case study on Utica College, and then wrap up with uh, a question and answer period at the end. So setting the table here a little bit, we wanted to, um, to acknowledge some big trends that we're seeing out in the marketplace. So the graph here on the left shows that in the last few years, what we've seen is an increasing amount of online of institutions selecting to move programs online. It's probably a surprise to no one. Uh, we're seeing this more and more. Uh, what's interesting is that similarly, the size of those portfolios is getting much larger. So we're seeing uh, an increased growth in the amount of competition online, uh, both in uh, the amount of competitors, but also in the diversity of what they bring to, um, to the online marketplace. Similarly, we did a study uh, recently where we looked at a number of, um, of institutions trying to get a sense for the scale of the institution relative to the number of programs that they bring into an online portfolio. What you're seeing in the visualization on the right here is each circle represents a university. Its uh, vertical placement represents the number of uh, graduates that um, were produced in programs that are offered online. And then its horizontal uh, placement is the number of online programs that brought them to that scale. And we can see there's a pretty uh, interesting trend, uh, especially as you start to get out in the fringes of the very large programs that are in the market, um, programs like Arizona State, uh, Southern New Hampshire, Western Governors. Uh, they have these really large, robust online portfolios, but even amongst some of the smaller schools, uh, really wide portfolios tend to yield larger amounts of programs or larger amounts of, of student audience. So we're often tasked here at uh, Wiley Education Services when we meet with our partners. There's several strategic challenges that we're often trying to answer around uh, bringing a portfolio or a suite of online degrees to the market. A lot of them focus into these four verticals, essentially. So there's operational challenges around uh, efficiency and how do, how do we grow quickly? How do we do that in a smart way? Uh, there's external challenges around an increasingly savvy customer, a customer that from some of our market research we find increasingly wants customization in their degrees. They want to be able to uh, tailor their degree or their learning um, experiences towards their careers. Uh, we'll see challenges uh, in the, the you know, delivering on retention goals, right, and making sure that we offer a set of programs that are producing graduates, that are, um, that, you know, are robust, rigorous programs in the market. Um, and lastly, all of this is, is probably underpinned by increasing financial pressures out there, right? So again, there's that, that ribbon of efficiency, but balancing it against quality uh, and ensuring that we can compete in, in an increasingly competitive marketplace. So what we often notice is, um, particularly when we deal with an institution who's maybe dipped their toe into the water with online learning or, or we, you know, um, has kind of started in the early days, we often find uh, this organic portfolio growth. And what I mean by that is uh, typically there, there's sort of a general call for interest uh, or maybe there, it's, it's sort of faculty-led initiatives where, um, or sometimes even sort of a nudge from maybe a, an employer or something like that to, to really offer a particular program online. And, and you get this kind of organic tapestry of non-related programs. Um, you get very little in the way of course sharing. Uh, you get some real inefficiencies when it comes to some of the ways that the marketing is done. You really get this kind of scattershot 
um, group of programs when you when you kind of rely on more of this organic growth that, that tends to happen. What we advocate for is taking a process, uh, typically top down, um, and and really thinking about what do we ultimately want to get to? What are sort of the the anchor programs? What are the what are the ten poles that we're really going to see produce the most the largest volume of students? And then how can we think about the interconnectedness between those anchor programs? Uh, that, that'll help us compete in a crowded marketplace. So this is a little bit more of an informed plan of development. Uh, typically, when you look at these per, uh, these portfolios, there's a lot more clustering around themes, uh, which is something we'll explore later on uh, at Utica College. Um, often, there's a lot of course sharing, so there's a, this kind of um, efficiency there where you're you're doing a lot more with less, uh, and then. Uh, the ultimate output is a broader market reach. So oftentimes we, when you've got uh, a more strategically defined um, portfolio, you're able to capture larger and larger shares of the market uh, because you have the offerings that, that students are, um, are looking for. So we thought it would be helpful to visualize a little bit about uh, what we're talking about when we're thinking about that strategic interconnectedness uh, between programs. And essentially it looks like this. So I'll take something like an MBA program, which we, we consider a large anchor program. It's a program that is uh, the largest graduate degree in the market. Uh, it's one of the more competitive online marketplaces. I think we're something in the neighborhood of 55% of all MBAs are, are offered online, or rather um, schools that offer MBAs offer online programs, online MBAs. Uh, it's a, a big draw. Now with that program, often the way that those develop, particularly on campus, is they usually have a core and then maybe a concentration that hangs off of it, often several concentrations. We like to think about those concentrations and the relative impact that they'll have on a larger portfolio. So is there a related program that maybe can leverage some of those classes from a concentration? So a great example would be um, something like a marketing program, uh, maybe a master's in marketing or a master's in accounting that has courses that are levered in the um, MBA program. It, it's interesting to us because a lot of the times this is how schools tend to have grown organically on campus, but when they move into the online space, usually this sort of pattern is, is a little less common. But using this course sharing, uh, another advantage of it is that you can start to think about different certificate programs that can be offered uh, through these degrees. Um, we found, uh, and, and Polly can attest to this later in the conversation, we found uh, that offering small packages of courses to the market as a certificate is a great way, particularly in the online space, to entice students uh, into areas of learning where they may not be confident enough to go through with a full graduate degree at the beginning of the, uh, the venture. They want, it, they want that confidence that they can be able to uh, come for maybe three or four classes and then leave with a credential of some sort. Um, and, and what's been a real great surprise for us is that a lot of those students actually do end up matriculating um, into full graduate degrees, or we even see some of those certificates get used by students who um, have graduated and come back to our institutions. Lastly, and this is probably one of the more critical elements of the conversation, is the opportunity to create unique interdisciplinary opportunities. So uh, a great example of this might be you've got a healthcare administration degree in uh, one college or, or one department, and you've got a, an MBA in the other. Is there an opportunity for you to have um, an MBA with a healthcare administration concentration? I'll tell you candidly, uh, we're often, uh, we field questions around uh, concerns around cannibalization and does it make sense for us to have two closely related programs um, in the market? Will, will one sort of cannibalize the audience for the other? And, and what we found is really the opposite. We find when you're able to go to the market with, um, with two kind of similar degrees, uh, what you find is that uh, they find strength together, right? There's the, the natural efficiency that happens in the course sharing, um, but also you'll find that as you draw students in through marketing efforts, if you don't have um, you know, the offering that they're looking for, you tend to bleed them away into another institution, right? They just sort of uh, go on their way to something else. If maybe they came in on a healthcare administration, but really they wanted an MBA with healthcare administration, you lose that student. Uh, but if you've got both of those in market, you're more likely to capture both. We also think it's really important, I mentioned that certificate strategy, uh, to think about uh, the entire stack of programs. So something that we are increasingly um, seeing in the marketplace and we're increasingly fielding questions around is uh, stackable, cert um, stackable credentials, stackable certificates into master's degrees. And these can be uh, what I described previously, these three to four class packages that might be something like your concentration in an MBA that stacks into an eventual degree, 
or they can be things like uh, MOOC to credit pathways. Uh, we're, we're starting to see a lot of those um, throughout uh, the market as well. So the bottom line here, though, is, is that it's important as you, as you sit back and you do your design work and you think about which programs you're going to bring to market, how do they impact this larger sort of web of programs? There's this mutual interconnectedness. Uh, we tend to find that programs that uh, think of themselves in this way tend to perform a lot better than programs that are sort of really unique and diverse and maybe don't have other things that they can um, you know, kind of marry up against in the larger portfolio. There's uh, a lot of the benefits I've been talking about have been specifically on what I would say like um, the sort of school efficiency side, but a lot of this is on the marketing side too. So obviously as you start to think about keywords and, and things like that that your, your university is spending against, uh, when you're able to go against some of these broader suites, uh, it can bring a real efficiency and, and capture a larger audience when you can go after healthcare degrees at uh, you know, school X or cybersecurity degrees at Utica, um, which we'll see later feeds into a number of different uh, potential program uh, offerings. So as, as we've been out in the market, uh, there, there's three real growth strategies that we've seen um, out there that, that time and time again, either with our, our own partners or, or other large institutions that we see out in the marketplace, they tend to follow one of these three paths. Um, and in reality, often a combination of the three. So we see uh, exist, uh, you know, evolving your online portfolio around your existing portfolio. So think of the things where you're currently strong, maybe current programs that are already in market uh, for you, uh, obviously evolving those and then thinking about what are the small ways that we can augment that offering. So we'll, we'll talk later about cybersecurity um, at Utica and thinking about, well, what are the ways that we can leverage that into different educational opportunities? Then there's the interdisciplinary uh, connectedness that we, we talked about in the prior slide where, where you can think about um, programs that are maybe across department, across college, uh, but think of ways to combine those programs in unique, exciting ways. I know a lot of the times that's easier said than done, especially when we start thinking about uh, different funding models and kind of financial arrangements within institutions, but the schools that are able to do this uh, really end up meeting the student where they want to be met. And, and increasingly we see from anecdotal data points um, survey data, things along those lines that the students are really looking for that customization and, and having different interdisciplinary opportunities, things like stackable credentials uh, can really help um, bring that diverse uh, you know, offering to, to the marketplace. And the last thing is uh, probably unsurprising, uh, you know, it's really thinking about investing in the high growth areas. And so, um, you know, right now in the market, that, that means healthcare is a large part of it. Business degrees still end up having a really large scale. Uh, and then lastly here, technology and data analysis, we're, we're seeing a lot of growth. Um, these three pillars are ones that we really recommend uh, for many institutions. They, they end up being the right move. There's other ones too, education and, and, and some other areas, um, you know, public administration, social work, things like that, where you can really have a lot of um, high growth as well, but really thinking about uh, where the market is, less so than I think the um, something we caution against is an idea that we're going to be real distinct and real different and go after kind of really small, narrow things and be the only school doing it, um, particularly in the online space. Sometimes that can have some challenges uh, because it's hard to find you. Um, so often, even with the more interesting things that we bring to portfolios, we try to think of them in context of uh, a larger suite of offerings um, to, to help support them. So um, one of the, the, the chief, you know, kind of things that, that my particular department deals with, and, and I, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, but I, I represent a market strategy and research department. We're a team of, of analysts, economists that, that provide consulting services to um, institutions as they grow their portfolios is we really come down to this conversation where we try to think about what are the key strategic uh, market research questions that we're, we're going to try to um, to go through to be able to support a program to provide that decision support on whether or not we move forward online. So I think at the core of all that is this conversation around uh, why are we offering this program? And for me, it's really critical to think about uh, the mission of the school, uh, the, the sort of objective in why you're choosing the online modality, why we're thinking about, uh, you know, kind of going after online. Is it uh, about reaching audiences that we've never reached before as an institution? Is it about, uh, you know, um, providing uh, something unique to the marketplace, really understanding why we're doing it? 
Uh, and then following that, you can really consider your audience and what, what are the things that your audience is going to want? How are you going to be properly serving uh, that audience? I will say uh, it's often surprising. Sometimes we go to market, we think uh, we're really going to attract one audience and the market uh, changes on us or we, we end up attracting a market that we weren't even ready for. And, and you know, sometimes there's changes and evolutions to this, uh, you know, whether it be early days in marketing strategy or even longer term in terms of what's offered from a program, but really trying to find out early on who your intended audience is can be really ground your research and, and your decision making process. Beyond that, it's really important to understand your market. Uh, so, so there is uh, d two main goals when we do our, our competitive assessment and we think about uh, markets that we're going after. Uh, the baseline is establishing the baseline, right? So it's understanding what is the norm in these markets, understanding what are students, what is that audience that we defined in step two here really going to expect uh, in the marketplace, it's important that you, you know, this is a, and oftentimes can be a uh, $20,000, $30,000 investment. It could take years of their life. We want to make sure that we're, we're meeting expectations that we're, we're, you know, this is a pretty large commitment from students. Um, but then thinking about the balance of that, how do we differentiate, right? Often with these markets that we're going to talk about, uh, they tend to be uh, increasingly more competitive as we saw in the online space. So it really becomes important to um, find that, strike that unique balance between being what's expected from the students, but also being different enough that you can stand out um, in a crowded space. Ultimately, you're defining your product, right? So understanding um, what it is that you're going to offer, whether that is, uh, like I mentioned before, maybe it's a set of stackable credentials that leads into a graduate degree. Maybe it's a, a portfolio of, of sort of interlocking programs that that sister up to each other around a related suite of topics, or maybe it's a really diverse portfolio um, of kind of loosely uh, related programs around uh, particular themes, but really understanding uh, within the product what, what we're bringing to the market, what that degree is, what that certificate is, um, you know, based on, on the research and the prior steps. And then lastly, this is probably what's most critical for today's conversation is what's the plan? Right? How does this interconnect with other things that are happening at the institution? So, so often um, when, we're, when we're, we're sort of uh, dealing with maybe a faculty-led initiative or maybe a department-led initiative, there's, there's this siloing effect that can happen where we're really excited about a, about a particular um, program or certificate or even class that we're bringing to the market, but we're not thinking about the larger impact to a broader portfolio. And it really should be something that's considered in the mix. Uh, you know, how does this maybe get jointly marketed with other things? How do we spread that marketing, um, you know, investment around? How do we, uh, you know, think about pathways students might take that would surprise us? So starting in program A and moving to program B, is that something uh, that we establish a pathway from, from the beginning? So really thinking about, uh, again, strategically defining your uh, program specifically, but then thinking about its impact in the broader portfolio uh, is, is really the thing that we advocate for and thinking about, um, about these products in a modular way. So how do they plug into uh, a, a larger um, system of programs and how do we, how do we sort of uh, gain those efficiencies? So uh, this is where I'm gonna introduce um, Polly into the conversation. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, the portfolio that they've been able to bring to market. Um, Polly, do you wanna spend a little bit of time? I've, I've laid out here um, a, a look at your online portfolio. Do you wanna kind of walk us through and tell us a little bit about it. Um, absolutely. So um, Utica College has been in the online market for more than 15 years, and I have been at the institution for about 15 years, and I'm responsible for um, not only as Associate Provost for Online Learning, the uh, management of the, the online and off-campus offerings, but also as the VP um, for Online and Extended Studies, kind of the market strategy. So strategic portfolio development is something that um, I have been working on for a number of years. And so I'm going to kind of take you back. Um, David is, has a slide up that shows you what we have now. But I think taking a walk through time and figuring out how we got there might be a little bit, might be helpful. So um, David talked a little bit about an organic portfolio and certainly Utica College was no different when it entered the online space. And we started with um, a degree, a master's degree in financial crime and compliance management and a doctorate in post-professional uh, post -professional transition to the, a doctorate in physical therapy. And those programs were very successful. And as the college um, took a look at, you know, okay, so we're doing this, what's next? Do we do more, do we do less? Uh, we worked with um, Wiley, our Wiley partner, and decided that an R and BSN degree would be something we could add to that 
add to that portfolio. And if you take a look at what we have now, that left us with uh, one master's program, one doctorate program, and one bachelor's program. And as we continued in the online market, we um, discovered that, as David has mentioned, that we really needed a plan, a better plan. You can't just take um, whatever or whoever is willing to put a program online and decide to move forward with that. So um, we looked at criminal justice and we started criminal justice uh, with a master's degree. And that didn't really work out for us, although that would have contributed to a pillar or a second master's degree and kind of started started to define, you know, where are we going to be in the online market. Uh, eventually, we moved into the undergraduate uh, cybersecurity area and then added criminal justice, added fraud investigation, um, added several um, specializations in cybersecurity. Um, we've since added another degree in um, the criminal justice area, criminal intelligence analyst, as well as a number of certificates so that students who um, were looking to try out college or maybe go back to college could get their feet wet without committing to a degree. So to, to David's point, one of the things we were focusing on at that period of time in our development was how do we how do we make sure that if someone calls and calls Utica College and says, I'm interested in an online program in the area of criminal justice, how do we have a conversation with those students and then figure out, well, what do they really want to do? And then have a degree that matches and will get them in the, upon completion of the degree into the market or into, the career, uh, into a career that meets, meets their needs and, and help them to achieve their goals. So we, we have moved through, um, the development process or the or building a portfolio in a way that was student centered. Um, so it's, it was as much for us about having a plan and being strategic as it was making sure that when students were looking to Utica College for a degree that we were able to provide them with a degree that would get them exactly where they wanted to go. If you look into the um, at, at that point in time, we had a, a pillar or a vertical uh, in criminal justice and cybersecurity. So as you see, one of our, our key focus areas or strategic focus areas is, or two of them are cybersecurity and criminal justice and fraud investigation. If you were to talk to folks on our campus, they see cybersecurity and criminal justice and fraud investigation as one thing and not two. So it was easier for us to be able to say to folks, okay, we have cybersecurity, we have a lot of students. How about um, what we call an advising specialization? An advising specialization for us is just a, a grouping of courses um, that allows students to say that they specialize in um, cyber crime and fraud or network forensics or um, the others the others that are listed we can slide those specializations in and out based on market demand or what we're seeing um, in terms of student interest so those that allows us to be very 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 flexible if it ever came to a point where one of those specializations grew to the point or interest in a specialization grew to the point that it would be worth um, separating it out and having a, a single a bachelor's degree, we would certainly do that. But we've had great luck in the last um, five to seven years just sliding specializations in and out depending on where there's market demand. Um, at the master's level, we took that idea of a specialization and um, we really ran with it. And for a while, uh, David, if you can remember um, back in time a little bit, we talked about the notion of a plug and play curriculum. So we had a core cybersecurity curriculum at the master's level and later developed a core MBA curriculum. And off of those um, initial sets of courses, I think there's maybe six um, courses, we, we took, a, we mixed and matched amongst all of the other um, master's programs in the criminal justice and cybersecurity area and have just attached specializations to them. And what we find is that the students, students come in and they, they might identify with cybersecurity um, intelligence and they'll get to just about the end of the intelligence uh, specialization and they'll say, well, do I have to be done or can I take another specialization? So we see students coming in um, to cybersecurity and then they take maybe one, two, or even three of those specializations before they, they leave Utica College with their, with their degree. The other path that a student might take is they might graduate with a cybersecurity degree and an intelligence specialization and then come back in two years and say, you know, I really wanna do the forensics specialization. 
they can either do that forensic specialization in just a four course sequence or they can take a couple of extra extra courses and end up with um, a certificate of advanced study. So in other words, that, that certificate at the graduate level as well. And as we saw more demand for certificates at the graduate level, we said, well, I wonder if we should develop a series of those and not only remarket those back to um, on graduates of our program, but also try to market them as standalone options for students who, again, might not want to commit to a master's degree, but would be willing to come and take a set of courses to give them an additional skill set to add to whatever it is that they already already have, um, uh, whatever degree cred or credential they already have. If we take a look at, at the cybersecurity and the specializations, the MBA and its various specialization, and then we add add one of our newer master's programs, data science. Data science is a, is a fairly small standalone program. I don't want to say it's a niche program, but for us, we didn't head in the business analytics direction, but in a social science um, analysis direction. And so it's, it's been smaller, but data science attaches to just about anything. So there's a data science specialization if you're um, in the cybersecurity program. There's a data science specialization if you're in um, the MBA. There's a data science specialization that will be coming live very soon if you're in healthcare administration. In addition to that, we're seeing students come in, we're taking a look at um, their abilities and their potential, and we're seeing that we probably should go backwards on that a little bit and, and create a bachelor's degree as well. So we'll, we'll, that'll be something that'll be in the works for us. But the, the idea is, is that we have a plan. So we went from what I would have viewed initially as an organic portfolio to one that was very strategic in nature. It is informed, there are clusters of programs, there's sharing of classes, um, efficiencies and scaling um, have been uh, made possible through these efforts and because it is a well-designed and thought out plan. And we have a broader market reach. So all of the things that David spoke to are certainly something that, that we've seen um, happen for us at Utica College. That's great. So, Paul, did you want to um, take us through some of the factors that you guys considered as, and I think you've done a little bit of that, but, um, you know, kind of some of your thoughts on, on some of these key topics around like pricing and how you guys meet uh, the labor market um, with some of the degrees that you have in your portfolio? Um, sure. So pricing is interesting. Um, coming from a background of uh, first K through 12 and then a very traditional ground campus in higher ed, when I came into the online space and folks started saying, well, how much are you going to charge for that program? I said, excuse me, don't we have a tuition rate? It doesn't it work the same way it works everywhere else. And, and they said, no, no, not really, because the online market's different. So for, for one, it, it has ebbs and flows. And when, we, when Utica College first entered the online market, it, it was thought that every online program had a life cycle. So when you entered a program into the, into the market, you were thinking, okay, so this program will be around for, I believe that the number was five to seven years, and then you'll have to replace it with something. So if you're gonna get used to that um, additional revenue stream, um, you, you better make sure that you're constantly in development, constantly in planning, constantly keeping an eye on the market. But in one of the, one of the critical areas that we've seen that you really have to keep an eye on, especially with increasing competition, is pricing. So what price will the market tolerate? And this is something for folks who are um, accustomed to just having one set tuition, students come, they take 15 credits a semester and on they go. That doesn't work in the online space. In the online space, you have to constantly be reevaluating what will the market tolerate for our cybersecurity program? What will the market and what can our brand demand um, in terms of costs for our r and BSN program? And for anyone that's, that's from New York, in New York, we're competing with free so pricing becomes a really uh, a real challenge, <laughs> as does as does the uh, the marketing piece. So what is what is the value add? What is our niche? How do we make sure that we stay um, that we stay competitive? So competing with free is fun for anyone who's in New York. You, you probably know what I'm talking about. So um, pricing is really really important. It's critical and it's something that we evaluate on an annual basis, um, and not only internally but we have conversations with Wiley in terms of where, what we're looking for an individual program to do. So if we want to keep a program small, then we, you know, the, the pricing might be a little, just a little bit higher, but enough, but, but, it, 
but enough so that we get the number of students that we're looking for. If we want to grow a program, it's not always the best strategy to decrease your price because there are a lot of people out there that believe in the fact that you get what you pay for. So mm -hmm. um, if you see declining enrollments in a program, so for example, we'll use, we'll use R into BSN because it's the BSN in 10 um, initiative is, is in place. And what we found is that um, some of the healthcare networks in New York have said, we'll reimburse if the SUNY tuition rate, which is, I, I don't know how much it is, but it's about $100 cheaper than what we charge. And we thought, okay, we took a look at the pro formas for these programs because we, we track those very, very carefully. Um, online education is a, is a diversified revenue stream for Utica College. So we took a look at the pricing and we said, can we afford to deliver this program in this format at the current quality so that we maintain our outcomes at, a diff at this, this reduced price? And the answer was no. So what do you do then? Do you just let the program die on the vine? Because not only do we reevaluate re pricing every, every year, but we reevaluate re whether we have the, the best um, mix of programs in our online por portfolio. And what we decided was we will go and partner with folks. So we took a look at um, some healthcare um, systems and we said, we went out and we made a value prop to them. And so we increased our enrollments or hope to increase our enrollments by having done that rather than changing the pricing. So, so leaving pricing aside and, and taking a look at job outlook, um, online students compared to traditional students who are gonna go for a brick and mortar experience, online students, it's kind of about the experience, but it's more about the outcome. So we find that our at Utica College, we find that online students are very task driven or goal driven. And so their goal is to come into our program, um, ex have a fairly lockstep experience that they don't have to think a whole lot about that will land them in a particular career path. So obviously if they're, you know, you look at um, the master's in science in nursing or an FN family nurse practitioner degree, those nurses are coming to Utica College to get a degree online and they want to get through as quickly, most efficiently and for um, and reliably as possible because they're looking at getting a different job. So when you're talking about or recruiting students into online programs, it is, it is essential to know where they're going so that in the experiences that you provide that they get there and it's important for the institution to know that there's going to be a job there. So when looking or planning um, what programs should be in an online portfolio, one of the things you're looking at is, well, where are their jobs? Because online students are, are going to school to accomplish a goal. And that goal is not just the credential that you're offering. It is, I want a different job. I want a job, I want a different job. And so it's, it's, an, it's really important to, have, to build relationships with these students and make sure that you know right up front where they're, where they're going. Um, so job outlook is important. Where are their jobs? What types of skill sets? What types of credentials um, are needed to get into those into those um, openings, those job openings? Yeah, I think that's really well said. Um, I'm curious, Paul. You mentioned uh, this idea that um, you know some of the programs that you were offering in the past were maybe had a you know five to seven year lifespan, and 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 they they might move. But it makes me wonder. Do, does Utica now think that there's the possibility for, for kind of evergreen programs, something like a, a cybersecurity degree where you mentioned there's that uh, sort of emerging disciplines and then they'll kind of come and go, but you can sort of maintain your core to a certain degree. Has the, has the thinking changed there? So the thinking has changed there. Um, and in terms of evergreen, our, our goal in terms of course or program development or redevelopment, you could say, has been mm -hmm. to develop a core um, set of courses that will stand the test of time. And so we don't go into those courses and the MBA and cyber are both good examples of that. We don't go into those courses and refresh them or change the content or change the materials very often because that content's gonna stand the test of time. Where we right. focus our energies and efforts are in the specialization courses um, and then in, in the technology that we use. So if technology or the tools and online courses change, then we'd certainly go in and tweak those. But um, it, it's it's not efficient in your time on content that's not going to change. Right. 
It, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so it's kind of thinking about that, that core platform and then thinking about these modules as they sort of uh, can meet the market, but then you're not sort of wrecking and rebuilding the whole thing um, on a regular cadence. It's more just freshening up the pieces that need it. That's really interesting. Um, you, you mentioned something earlier that I wanted to go back to, uh, you know, and forgive me, I, I think I, heard, I missed the term that you were using, but you were talking about different advising pathways uh, that are done in the program. Is, is the idea here that these are not necessarily transcriptable, uh, like majors and minors? So, so the the term I was using was advising specialization. Um, again, okay. those, those from New York, if you have a concentration in a program, it has to be approved by New York State Ed. If you have an advising specialization, you can switch those in and out at your leisure. So um, the specializations, the ones that are identified on the, the, sl the prior slide, so cyber crime and fraud, network forensics, information assurance, cyber operations, those specializations are denoted on the degree and on the transcript. Mm -hmm. However, we can mix and match courses based on what um, the student wants to do with the course. So our, our program director of cybersecurity, especially well, both at the undergrad and the graduate level, um, has conversations with students who come to him and say, you know what I really wanna do? I wanna work here. So he has to have the, the um, enough knowledge in the field and be aware of the major employers in cybersecurity to know, okay, if you want to get a job at AFRL, well, well, that's one of the places that students often want to work, then you actually need this set of courses. So we will mix and match those beyond what's prescribed um, in writing to make sure that that student has the skill set that he or she needs to move into that position. That's great. That's a, yeah, and that's something that like so we see that broadly in a lot of uh, the sort of behavior of students that they want to be able to have that customization. But I understand the tension between that and then having to go through these different approvals and things along those lines. It seems like a really creative solution to be able to uh, to meet students where they they need to be met. That's great. Um, so I I did have another question um, you know before we kind of move it out to the audience around. Uh, you know, kind of thinking strategically and thinking about how we're, we're making additions to the, the portfolio. Uh, where do you see, what's the time frame on that? Do you feel like Utica College has a, you know, 10 year plan or is it more of a three year plan or is it a three month plan uh, as it grows? How, uh, how far out do you think you guys are looking right now? So I would think that we're looking three to five years out. And part of what um, mm -hmm. drives me to say that is that we're in the strategic planning process and we've taken the approach where we're gonna have a five year a five-year planning process, um, at least for the next two or three rounds. So I have a fairly good idea um, what we'll be looking at and the types of things that we'll be doing or revisiting, uh, either creating new, revisiting existing um, pieces of portfolio, exploring things like stackable credentials in some of the um, areas, some of the verticals. So um, it's usually three to five years because my experience is, is um, the administration or the leadership at the college, which I'm a part of, believes that uh, we can uh, take a program to market within a year. Um, yeah. I know that that is not the case. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, although, I, although I do have to, you know, play, play along with my colleagues. So we are working on that. One of the things that is in the, our new strategic plan is a go-to-market strategy that's more responsive to the market in terms of timing, which causes, will cause us to have to uh, reevaluate internal processes, external processes, and also factor in accrediting bodies. Um, so when we think of planning what's happening next in the online space, I'm always trying to look uh, five years ahead to see mm -hmm what do I need to do? What's new and different? And David, how many times have I come to you and said, okay, yes, 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 I hear, I know what's going on in the market now. What should I be looking to try to socialize on my campus and with the faculty for three, four years from now? So, sure. um, and, you know, some of that is, is speaking to looking at what, what the job outlook is going to be. Some of that is trends in industry. So one of the things that we're seeing is that some employers aren't looking for a bachelor's degree anymore. And this is, this is one of the things that leads us to look into that stackable credential piece. They, they're saying, well, if you just have these five things, we'll hire you. Yep. So that creates a different space in the market where um, you, you need to be able to provide those five things and let someone walk away with X 
and then figure out how to re-engage them into the bachelor's degree and then the, maybe a master's level certificate and then a master's degree and then on to the terminal degree. Because um, what, what we're seeing in terms of student trends is that students really want to go to a college. They select a college now based on, will it take me where I ultimately want to go just as much as will it get me what I need right this instant? Mm -hmm. I think mean, connecting that to something you said earlier, one of the things we've seen Utica do is, is, you know, kind of recognize today's really popular concentration might be tomorrow's discrete degree, right? And kind of thinking through how do we, how do we quickly address these markets in, in the short time, you know, time span, relatively speaking, and then how do we think about where they, where they land in a longer horizon? There's that, um, you know, kind of, how do you capture the market today, but how do you think about and reorient to the market tomorrow? That's, that's great. Um, so with that being said, uh, I, I think we wanted to open up, um, got about 90 folks on the, on the phone here, uh, wanted to see if we had um, any questions from the audience for uh, Polly Smith of Utica College or myself from um, Wiley Education Services. Yeah, so we've had a handful come into the chat. Um, I'm just going to start from the top. I believe it was when David was talking. Um, another David is asking who has or who have been the decision makers or stakeholders that you look to bring to the table to make these kind of strategic decisions? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I'm going to start answering it, but I think Polly would be a great, um, you know, kind of give us a good real world uh, sense of it. So I'll tell you that um, oftentimes uh, where I get engaged is kind of at all levels. So, so some of these questions will happen um, in the in the provost's office, uh, you know, even up to the president. But uh, oftentimes, uh, what I think has been the most successful strategy is to engage. Uh, department heads, faculty, uh, to really ensure that these aren't um, solely kind of uh, cold plans pushed out from uh, the top down, but really that there's there's that buy-in throughout. Um, and, and then Polly, I think, brought up a good point too that that the students are part and the the industry are part of the stakeholders as well, right? And we um, oftentimes it might be hard to get them to the table, but we've got different tools available to to try to listen in on them too and see what their perspectives are. But I'm curious, Polly, you could probably speak more directly to this. Um, who do you see as the stakeholders at the table as you think about uh, Utica's portfolio? So as I look at the as I look at the portfolio. Um, there are many stakeholders and I will, I will give kudos to my online program directors. They, um, they are really central to any decisions that are made. So certainly ideas come, um, they come from the administration, they come, they come down from the administration, they come up from the faculty, they come um, from outside sources. Um, lots of times folks come to us and say, can you create this or will you offer that? Um, yeah. It has, it has to be a conversation. So is the so the decision ultimately is uh, we have an internal curriculum development you know process just like any other college that you know walks from the, a faculty member through a department through a curriculum committee and then to a senate and then up to the provost of course um, but without so at, at Utica College we've chosen a, a model where certainly our our upper administration does support the online initiative at the college. Um, my position is in place to manage the portfolio, so both the existing and as well as the development, the new, the new um, initiatives that we take on. So at the end of the day, everything kind of lands on my desk and I have conversations with folks and I make a recommendation to uh, the president's cabinet to um, that we should either yes, go forward or no, we will not. However, the ultimate decision is generally made by the pro forma. So is this going to be a financially yeah. lucrative decision for the college or not? Well said. Okay, uh, we have a couple questions related to faculty. So how do you find qualified, well-credentialed faculty to teach courses in both traditional and online courses simultaneously? Um, related to that, what's the faculty model in your online division? Do full-time faculty teach in online as well? Do you use a majority of adjuncts? Um, so I'll try to take those in order. 
So how do we find faculty? We um, always start with our existing faculty and hope to find a subject matter expert or, or expertise in our existing full-time faculty that primarily, and most of them primarily, primarily serve um, the traditional ground campus. But I would say that most of the faculty at Utica College teach both online and on ground. So that's, that's our full-time faculty. Um, how do we, are the online classes more likely to be taught by adjuncts? I would say that that's, there's a difference between the undergraduate and the graduate offerings. So in the, at the graduate level, whether you're taking an online graduate program or a ground graduate program, often there are, there's a large, maybe half of the credits might be taught by an adjunct, but that's more connected to the fact that um, you want field expertise in your classes at the graduate level. So. Um, we do use adjuncts. Um, however, most of the course building takes place um, by the full-time faculty. So it, we'll have a full-time faculty that oversees that master course shell. So there'll be one course, um, say CRJ 103, um, is, is a course that's been created. It's taught both on ground and online um, using the same objectives because Middle States says that that is the way we will do things. Um, the content might be a little bit different. The, the, the assignments might be a little bit different, but in many cases, the ground course is the same as the online course, although it's structured and designed a little bit differently. Um, and full-time faculty could teach it just as well as an adjunct. Did I, did I think that's a, I'm sorry, Polly, I just wanted to add one thing to that and highlight something that you said, that, that idea that um, the adjunct faculty, I've heard them called instructors of practice and a number of other terms out there, especially in, in some of these um, quantitative fields, things like cybersecurity, um, you know, that's a real value add for some students uh, in those markets. So we do, um, I think that's a, a great point um, in the mix here. So, so the notion of a professor of practice is a, is a good one. And we have full-time faculty that are professors of practice. They're not on a tenure mm -hmm. track, but they are full-time. And the, your example of cybersecurity, David, is a good one. So for a very long time, our masters of cybersecurity had an online program director um, who was here on campus, but all of the courses were taught by adjuncts. And that was because that he came from industry to Utica College to build this program. And that's where all his connections were. So he knew exactly who yeah. to choose from industry to come in and build these classes and then teach them. Uh, let's see, going on the list here, what audience are you serving in the online undergraduate degrees? Traditional age students, adult degree completers, or both? So um, a point of clarification, I'm watching my chat box here a little bit too. So up until this year, our undergraduate degrees were degree completion programs. So they were um, targeted at folks who had an associate's degree but never finished their bachelor's degree. So most of those students were not traditional age students, but they were um, adults that were coming back to school who were already working, had some experience in the workplace, but, but needed that credential to be able to get a promotion or just to compete with, with um, younger folks who were coming um, into the job market with a four-year degree already. Um, this year, we started offering um, fully online uh, bachelor's degrees, which in what we're seeing mostly is not necessarily high school students, but, but folks who have maybe 15, 18, 30 uh, credits worth of college work and um, are in the workplace for, for a number of reasons and yet really want to finish their degree. So, and again, people can find themselves in that situation in any, for any number of reasons, or they have taken a, a, some, a technical, they have a technical credential and don't have enough liberal arts courses to transfer in. So that pathway for us um, is fairly new. And um, we do have, you know, biology online with a lab. We do have you know, English and history and all those types of things um, online. So I think it's, it varies now, or it will vary moving forward, given the, the trends seem to indicate that 18 to 24 year olds, if you can come up with some sort of face-to-face -face or networking experience within an undergraduate degree, they are not necessarily 100% sold on the brick and mortar experience. Not all of them. Yeah, I, I think it's um, fair to say that the, the lion's share of the uh, online bachelor's market is still going to be that sort of bachelor completer kind of style that, that you mentioned, um, Polly. But what we're seeing uh, increasingly become common, especially at some of the larger state schools, is fourth year online. So students are, are sort of getting in career 
uh, in their junior years and then thinking about ways that they can um, take those final few classes uh, in an online modality. I know that's something that's increasingly becoming a trend and something we definitely have our eye on. And, and we see that with our ground population as well. We see them, um, yep. they do an internship over the summer in their junior year and they say, can I finish up online? I've got an offer for a full-time job. Yep. yep. Uh, we've got a good question in the Q&A from Paul. He asks, how much market research does Utica do to determine new programs? And how deep does this market research go? And who within Utica is responsible for this effort? So Utica College does not do its own mar market research. We partner with Wiley, and so uh, David does our market research. <laughs> 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 so I'll be right up front there. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have a whole team of analysts that make me look good. But yeah, it's uh, uh, my department does a lot of the research. Um, candidly, uh, we do a fair amount, right? So we, we do a lot of looks at um, historically how, you know, what are sort of the size and shapes of these markets. We look at... Um, you know, things you would expect. So like Bureau of Labor and Statistics projections and Google trend analysis and stuff like that. Uh, one key thing that we do is we uh, use a labor market intelligence tool called Burning Glass and they look at job posting data. So we think it's really important, um, especially with some of the degrees like in Unica's portfolio to think about what are employers hiring and this gives us uh, a way to, to kind of um, pull that information from them. And then lastly, we do a fair amount of uh, competitive assessments. We put ourselves in the seat of the, the online student and we say, you know, if I was, uh, you know, kind of a, at this point in my career and I was thinking about getting a degree, where would I want to go? And we, and we look at a number of different institutions and try to, uh, you know, bring that advice into the conversation as well. So it's pretty extensive, um, you know, market research, but it's, uh, I think it's really important, you know, because that's where we've seen some real wins in terms of even simple things like what to call a program or to Polly's point earlier, like how to price a program or how to think about different design aspects. Uh, a lot of that can often be informed um, or, or can get us unstuck from, you know, that analysis paralysis is by using uh, some of this market data. Uh, so another question, how do you plan for the academic support services for the online programs? So initially, um, Utica College tried to use, tried to, to create that support system um, on its own. Um, we soon, as as the as we scaled and the number of online students we had, and then the the breadth and depth of program offerings that we had um, grew. We we again we we partner with Wiley for things like success coaching, um, admissions, recruitment, marketing, that whole piece of academic services, um, right up through course design. So. Although we have internal supports um, that parallel what we do for our ground students, um, Wiley does pick up many of those pieces because the, um, the relationship with an online student is a, a little bit different than a relationship with a brick and mortar student. If, if for no other reason, you're not, you're not seeing them face to face. They can't walk into an office. They can't walk into, you know, you know, into, into a faculty office or into student financial services or admissions or the registrar. So there has to be um, someone dedicated to doing, to working with those students to make sure that they get the same level and quality of student as our ground students, <clears throat> as our ground students get. So we partner for those things. And, and it, it wasn't because we didn't try to do some of these things on our own first, but because about half of our student population is either online or remote um, at a, an offsite location, we have to make sure that um, for regulatory and accreditation, accrediting body reasons, um, that the students have that, that same level of support as we would provide to a ground student. And it's a, it would be impossible for us to staff that. Yeah, the, the way we see it is that there's, there's two big investments there too. There's the staffing component that Polly mentioned and really having the, the kind of, you know, the, the personnel able to do it. And then there's the technology investment. Increasingly, these are becoming more and more savvy uh, consumers that just have an expectation that they should be able to, um, you know, chat during a customer service experience or text someone or things along those lines, right? And so be, making sure that we have those pipelines as well for students and that we're thinking as a school, you know, in the same way that other customer service experiences um, are for students and making sure that we can really um, ultimately help these, retain these people and make sure that they make it all the way through to graduation is important. 
And, and David, on that point, retention is key because it, there's a there's a potential if the students don't have the right amount of support or if the curriculum hasn't been designed for an online format because it is still false that a, you can take a ground course and put it online. It's always been false, but <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, and I learned that the hard way <laughs> as a as an instructor. I can't just record my one hour lecture and put it online. That's not going to work but, that way. You can, but your retention will not be high. <laughs> so, um, and one of the things that, that Utica College has been very successful in, is, and this is across the Wiley group of partners, is um, one, we still have all the programs. We're still offering all the programs that we started with. So we have legacy programs that have stood the test of time. And our term over term retention in these programs, program by program and not overall, is, it's, is over 90%. So we don't even have that on ground. And so as, as a small um, private college, we, we look at our ground population and they say, oh, we're gonna buy this. And I said, you can, you can do whatever you want in terms of retention efforts to stay out of the online space <laughs> because I'm successful and I don't wanna be where you are. <laughs> but it takes work, it takes support. Yeah, and, and, and whatever the tools and techniques we use today are, they're going to be different three years from now. Uh, I think is the other part too, where it's got to keep evolving. Yeah. Online programs and online student support are not static. They're constantly evolving. They're co you're constantly planning. You're constantly, again, looking for what's around the next corner. What do I need to be able to do next? And how do I get there as fast as I can? Mm -hmm. All right, I think we're mostly caught up on questions. We have just a couple minutes left. Um, so I don't know if Polly or David, if you have any closing comments, um, we might be able to take one more question if it comes in. Yeah, I just think that the fundamental takeaway here is that um, we, we are supportive and, and we definitely do see a lot of success with kind of uh, really interesting, unique programs in the market online. Uh, just your best path forward with those is to think about what are the, the larger anchor programs that will help support them and, and ensure that they'll be self-sustaining. I think that should be the big one, the big takeaway here uh, is that there, there is room for, for a really diverse online portfolio, but, but you've got to kind of think structurally about uh, the whole uh, to make sure that all, all those individual parts are successful. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that, that I would focus first, if you're not in the online space, I would focus first on the strengths that you have on your ground campus. And I would start yeah. there, because if you're strong on ground, you'll, you'll likely, you're more likely to be strong online. Don't start with something brand new to the college. It's a great point. Yeah. We've got one more quick question that just came in. Are Utica students able to float back and forth between ground-based and online courses to complete their academic program? So we do allow ground students to take um, online classes, um, but if they're going to switch, if they're going to take their entire semester or their entire semester load online, then they do have to switch from being a ground student to a distance student. But we do have to be able to track students, and, and one of the things that's one of the ways we track students here at Utica College is based on campus. So we have a ground campus and we have an online campus. That's just tracking through Banner, though. So. Great, thank you. Uh, well, at this time, I think we are at time, so I'd like to say thank you again to David and Polly for the great presentation today. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, just a reminder that this was recorded, so you'll receive a link to the recording in the slides um, later tomorrow afternoon. So I will turn it back over to David for any final comments, and thank you guys. Have a great rest of your day. Um, thanks for your time, everyone. Uh, looking forward to future conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Molly. Thank you, David. Have a good day. Thanks, all.